Welcome back. It's both my honor and my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Jim Gash, uh, the director of the Global Justice Program at Pepperdine University School of Law, and a person I count as both uh, a friend and an inspiration to me. Uh, Professor Gash actually has a, a number of Texas connections. He went to undergrad at Abilene Christian University, uh, where he played quarterback for the football team. Uh, I was going to announce him as the starting quarterback, but then he told me last night that that was kind of in and out, starting, not starting, starting, not starting. But I don't, uh, and, and then uh, after uh, completing law school at Pepperdine uh, Law School, uh, shortly thereafter, he came back to Texas to Houston to clerk for uh, well-known United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit Judge uh, Edith Jones. Uh, after that, he went to work for uh, Kirkland Ellis, uh, first in its D.C. office and then in its L.A. office. And uh, in 1999, uh, he joined the Pepperdine Law Faculty, uh, where he's been since then. Uh, about eight years ago, in 2010, uh, he started making trips to Uganda with Pepperdine Law students to advance uh, the rule of law. Uh, I met uh, Professor Gash uh, two years ago this month. Uh, he was visiting Baylor and he told me what the Pepperdine Law School was doing uh, in Uganda and invited me to come along uh, that summer on their prison project. And uh, uh, I already had my summer booked. I thought there's no way I can do this. And uh, a month or so later, I thought this, this may be one of those knocks on the door. I, I, I should be doing this. And, got over there in the prison project, and uh, uh, it, was, it was fascinating. Uh, visited three, program, uh, three prisons, spent five days at three prisons. The prisons uh, were at four times capacity. And even if they had been under capacity, it would not have been a nice place to be if you didn't have to be there. Four times capacity, and uh, a lot of those persons were, as they say in Uganda, on remand. Uh, they were waiting for their trial. They hadn't been tried and convicted. They were in prisons with adult convicted prisoners. Uh, they had not been tried. Some of them waited three years, four years, five years or more uh, for their trials. Uh, Professor Gash and Pepperdine Law students have been active in the last eight to ten years uh, helping uh, uh, the Ugandan judiciary implement uh, uh, and prosecutors implement a plea bargaining program to try to move some of those cases more quickly to reduce the overcrowding in the prisons and to help some persons get access to justice uh, a little bit more quickly than waiting five or six years for a trial, often when the prosecutor just doesn't even have the evidentiary goods to convict uh, when it gets to trial. Uh, we were up at, at the, before the crack of dawn. Uh, we would leave, uh, uh, we were up at 5 o'clock, we'd leave when it was dark, we'd drive two hours to a prison, uh, the roads, I I've never seen potholes like that in my life, literally three foot, four foot deep potholes in the road, uh, life killing potholes if you didn't have a good driver uh, that could see them in the dark and weave around them. Um, uh, we'd be at the prisons all day. Uh, 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 you know, sometimes under shelter from the sun. Uh, in, in that week, uh, we helped uh, uh, at over 250 to 300 prisoners get their cases uh, moved along and move a little bit uh, more quickly uh, to justice. Um, the last thing I want to say before I turn it over to him is uh, my, my primary impression of, of Jim there was he looked at these persons that we were helping not just as, as objects of uh, American grace. Um, they, were, they were human beings. Uh, and after we'd spend all day in the prison, we might have a soccer game with them. Uh, or uh, 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 a couple of them, we, uh, he arranged to bring them a goat uh, or a cow. And they would have a, a feast that uh, uh, after not having enjoyed anything like uh, steak uh, 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 for years, uh, if ever. So uh, with uh, no further ado, uh, Professor Gash, thank you very much for coming to Baylor. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here back at Baylor. Um, Pepperdine and Baylor have a lot in common. 
Uh, both are Christian institutions that are dedicated to preparing students for lives of purpose, service, and leadership. And we both overlook a beautiful body of water. <laughs> Ours is a little bit bigger than yours, but you have one nonetheless. I was having dinner last night with Dean Tobin. We were talking about uh, Pepperdine and talking about Baylor, and I was <clears throat> lamenting that occasionally we lose students to Baylor. They're choosing between uh, schools, as most of you chose between schools. Some people will be in, uh, admitted to both Baylor and Pepperdine. And when we lose them, we're sad, but at least I feel good knowing that they're coming to a place that values them and values their education and is going to encourage them to be ministers to the broken, because that's what lawyers are. That's what law students are going to be. Think about every person in our society who's broken. Somebody who has been arrested and charged with the crime. Who's the first person standing with that person? When somebody is uh, injured through somebody else's negligence or injured by a product, you've got a plaintiff's attorney standing with them. When someone is going into bankruptcy, who's standing with them in their worst and most difficult times is a lawyer. When a family is falling apart, there's a family lawyer standing with them. When the IRS is after you, there's a lawyer standing with you, a tax lawyer. When the bank is foreclosing on your home, who is standing with people in the most difficult times when you're fired from a job illegally? Who's standing with you is a lawyer. And that's what you're going to be. At your best, you're going to be ministers to the broken. Many of you, growing up, knew this is what you wanted to do. What I want to do is help people in deep need. I was not one of those people. Someone told me 30 years ago while I was an undergrad at Abilene Christian that I was going to be going to law school, I would have been surprised. If I, got to, if I knew I was going to go to Pepperdine, it might have been a pleasant surprise. If someone would have told me 20 years ago when I was practicing law at Kirkland and Ellis that I was going to get to be a professor, I would have been very surprised. But if someone would have told me even 10 years ago that part of what I was going to be doing as a professor was traveling to the developing world and sitting with kids in juvenile prisons and leading lawyers like Brian and others to adult prisons and trying to give them access to justice as they were waiting for someone to do something, I would have been very, very surprised. But I worship a God of surprises, and he surprises me. And I'm sure he's not through surprising me. I'm also someone who likes to surprise as well. I've got three kids. My, uh, my boy Joshua, this is taken about 15 years ago, he is, he is a, a sophomore at Pepperdine studying abroad in London right now. But when he was five, he had, uh, he had this ear problem, even from when he was younger, to where he wasn't really allowed to get his head wet. He wasn't allowed to get his, his head underwater because he had an, a, an eardrum issue that caused infection whenever it got wet. So we went camping one time with my, with my cousins and their kids, and we were camping in Oregon, and we were right on the edge of a lake, and the first day, all of the kids played in the water all day, and Joshua had his, his uh, life jacket on, and he stood on the shore because he was afraid to go in. By this time, we'd fitted him with an, uh, an ear, uh, one of those ear molds, but he was still deathly afraid of the water. So day two, I said to Joshua, I said, Joshua... All of your friends are playing in the water all day, and you're standing on the shore watching. You and I need to go for a walk. So we walked out onto the pier. I said, Joshua, I need you to do me a favor. I said, yes, Daddy. He was a good kid. He still is a good kid. Yes, Daddy. I said, I, I need you to jump in. He looked at me, big eyes, walked over to the edge of the pier. Looked like he was almost going to jump in but then turned around and grabbed me and said, I'm afraid, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. So I picked him up and held him really tight. I said, Joshua, I've got one question for you. One question. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Yes, Daddy, I trust you. Okay, Joshua, I need you to let go. He held on as tight as he could possibly hold on. I said, you trust me, right? He said, yes, I trust you. I said, if you let go, I'm not going to make you jump in. Pause let go. I threw him in. <laughs> Surprise. See, the thing about being a lawyer is you learn how to say things that are true. I'm not going to make you jump in, but aren't necessarily accurate. <laughs> I had no idea 
he could scream that loud. <laughs> Everybody in the shore is like, what's that guy doing to his kid? He dog paddles as fast as he can back to the edge of the pier. I pick him up and throw him in again. And this happened three or four times. And then the last time, instead of swimming over to the shore, or over to the pier, he swam over to the shore and spent the rest of the week playing with his friends. So the question he, I had for him was, are you willing to trade almost for more? You want to go in there. You're almost ready to do that. Are you willing to do that? And that's the question that I, and I'm sure many of you, have felt your whole life. The same question. For me, it's a different father asking me, do you trust me? Do you trust me? My answer for most of my life, I listen to Shannon and, and uh, Kirsta talk about what they've been doing for so long and think I too was, uh, had my hands over my ears for most of my life. But my change started in 2007 when our students formed the first, at Pepperdine Law, formed the first ever IJM student chapter at a law school. And I was a dean of students at the time. I said, this is fantastic. I'm excited for you. Wonderful organization. Heard great things. And then they said, we want to have an IJM week. So February of 2007, they had an IJM week. And they brought in speakers from around the country to talk about global justice projects. Their second speaker on a Tuesday was a guy named Bob Goff. And Bob had a gathering about this large, about 170 students, and he told these students about doing justice around the world, and he said, you guys should come to Uganda with me. Two students came running up to my office after the gathering was over, and they said, we want to go to Uganda with Bob Goff. And my first question was, who's Bob Goff? This is what he looks like before he has coffee in the morning. Some of you know who Bob is. Second question was, where's Uganda? Like many of you, many people that are my age, looking at an African map in 2007, I could tell you where two countries were. Through my immense powers of deduction, I could figure out where South Africa was. <laughs> and because I've heard the story of baby Moses so many times, I knew where Egypt was, but I could not have found Uganda on a blank map or even close. The reason is, is that my generation, what we understood about global justice was what we saw on television when Sally Struthers, some of you may remember her, an actress, would get on there and say there are starving kids around the world and she'd have either African kids or Southeast Asian kids and she would say, you need to do one thing. Your call to action is to send money. So that's what we did, my generation did, when we heard about things that were in people in need as we sent money. But your generation says, okay, I understand that there's people in need, but I have studied abroad, or I have watched videos on the internet, or I'm capable of traveling. Baylor law students, like students around the country, say, forget about just sending money, I'll do that too, but send me. I want to go. And so these students are saying, can you send us to Uganda with this guy, Bob? So I go across the hall to my boss, your former president, my boss at the time, Ken Starr, and said, we got these two students, they want to go to Uganda, they want to send them, let's see what they come back with. So they went in March of 2007, and they went to this judicial conference, national judicial conference that Bob was hosting, and they met all these judges from around the country, and they came back with big eyes and bright ideas, and they said, Dean Gash, we've got an idea. The judges in Uganda have no law clerks, post-grad, they have no interns or externs, in fact, most of them don't have computers. They have a pen and a piece of paper when they have paper. We could be their interns and their law clerks. Once again, hey, boss, what do you think about this? And Dean Starr said, send them. So we sent three to Uganda for the summer in 2008. One worked for the Supreme Court of Uganda, one worked for the Court of Appeals, and one worked for the High Court, which is the trial court. And they came back and said, we can actually be really helpful. So the summer of 2008, we sent 10. Summer of 2008, I went to Europe because I was on my way to England where we have a study abroad program where I was going to be the professor there. And during that trip, we stood on the southern tip of Europe, Gibraltar, a place called Cape Europa or Europa Point. 
And as we were standing there, my wife says, hey, kids, stand with Dad. Let's get a picture. Because we can see Africa in the background, right across the ocean. And my oldest daughter says, Daddy, are we going to Africa? And I said, no, we're traveling around Spain and Portugal, and then we're going to fly to Latin. She said, I know where we're going now. Are we ever going to Africa? My answer was, I have no plans to go to Africa. I don't feel equipped to do anything Africa needs, and it didn't seem like the best vacation spot at the time. Well, if the camera could have focused over my shoulder 3,000 miles down into Africa, down into East Africa, down into a small town called Masindi, where there was a remand home, it would have seen 21 kids in this warehouse, arrested, charged with the crimes, just waiting for someone to do something. Two of those kids who had just arrived were named Henry and Joseph. They were brothers. They had been charged with murder along with their father for a mob killing that had taken place in their village. Their, their herdsmen had stolen money from their house and escaped. Three days later, villagers found him in the, in the, uh, the town center, captured him, beat him to death, and deposited him on their front porch. Because when you don't have confidence in a functioning public justice system in a country, that's what you do. You don't turn them over to the police because they're going to bribe their way out, or you have no idea what's going to ultimately happen to this person. So they were charged with murder. They were waiting there for two months in a Hoima jail before they were moved into this remand home. And Henry, at that time, wrote this. The boy next, next to me fell asleep right after the prime minister put out the lamp. I did not. I had not seen two of my brothers and my sister for two months. I had not seen my father for one month. I wondered how my mother would survive without the income from the envelope business. She would soon have to start selling the animals. I wondered how long Joseph and I would be here. I heard two or three boys crying softly. One of them sounded like Joseph. When he cried in the Hoima jail, I could comfort him. I thought about going over to his bed, but that was against the rules. I imagined what my mom would say if she were here. She would tell me that God is in control and that he uses even the bad things to make good. I tried to remind myself of this. I wanted to believe it very much. I did not know what else to do, so I prayed very hard, like I'd been praying for every night for two months. I asked God to help Joseph go to sleep so he would not be sad. I asked him to protect my mom and brothers and sister at home. I asked him for my father's release so he could take care of my family. I asked him to help Joseph and me be released soon. But most of all, I asked God to help me keep believing he was still hearing my prayers. I, of course, knew nothing of this because I was never going to Africa. But the question that he later told me that he felt like God was asking him was, do you trust me? Do you trust me with what's going on right now? Do you know that I have a plan for you? Fall 2009, a year later, Henry's still in prison. Pepperdine hosts Amb uh, uh, Baroness Carolyn Cox. She is a British member of the British House of Lords. She comes to Pepperdine to talk about doing justice in the world as part of our fledgling global justice program. I'm still dean of students. I'm still a cheerleader for the students. But she gives this talk, not unlike the talk I'm giving. And at the very end, there's a time for question and answer. And one of the students says, I've got a question for you. Is it better to travel halfway across the world to meet someone in their darkest needs, or is it better to take the money you would, the money you would have spent and send it to them to meet their needs? I thought, that's a great question and an even better excuse for not going. Her response was unequivocal. She said, please go, and here's why. If you travel across the world and meet somebody in their darkest need, first of all, it's going to be a great encouragement to them because they're going to know that somebody on the other side of the world knew about them and cared enough to come and visit them. And when you're there, you're going to see their needs, and you're going to realize you can make an impact, and you're not going to be able to turn away. And when you go back home, you're going to have a massive ripple, uh, massive ripple effect on those around you. So I thought, wow, what a wonderful answer. We need to be sending more students. Because at that time, I will confess that my Bible read, there are they, Lord, send them. And I was really good at trying to help send them. And then a month later, the same guy appears in my life. 
he is the keynote speaker at the National Christian Legal Society Conference in San Diego that year. And he's doing this talk. This is before he had written a book. And he's talking about love. And he's talking about what love looks like. He says, if you love, then you will do. Love does. It doesn't just pray for people. It doesn't just send money. It doesn't just encourage them. If you love, then you will do. He later wrote a book by the same uh, title that sold over a million copies now. And I guess he was here last week just at the, at, um, the undergrad. He talked in that speech about a prison of kids in Masindi, Uganda. He said, there's 21 kids in this prison, and they're just waiting for someone to do something. We should go. And I remember in that, in that moment thinking something was very different in my life. By the time Bob finished, I was neck deep in one of those moments when you know things have instantly changed, when you see with uncommon clarity and feel compelled to life-changing action. Up to that point, I had experienced only about a dozen such moments, one of which came in June of 1996 when I suddenly realized I wanted to marry Jolene Oliver. Another was in 1999 when I decided to leave the practice of law to become a professor at Pepperdine. These moments, however, can vanish as quickly as they appear. Sadly, I'd let most of them pass without having the fortitude to heed their call. In the midst of this moment, however, I was overcome with an overwhelming urge not to let this call go unmet. I had no idea the extent to which my life would be forever changed. No idea the heights of joy and the depths of sorrow this decision would bring. But when I leaned over to Jay, our global justice director at the time, at the end of Bob's talk and whispered, dude, we're going to Africa. There was no turning back. But there was a lot of doubt. And during that time, leading from September of 2009 to January of 2010, I had to keep asking my question, or I had to keep listening to this question, do you trust me? I've got something for you. But the answer to the question whether you trust me depends upon the answer to a different question. It's who's writing your story. Because I had, I had written 42 chapters in my story over the prior 42 years that I thought were pretty good. I had an awesome wife and three great kids. I had a job at Pepperdine teaching law school in Malibu. And I wasn't looking for a new adventure or a new cause, particularly in the developing world as someone who had never actually done anything that resembled a mission trip. But in January of 2010, I got on this plane with three other guys, one of my former students who was then directing a global justice program, and two alums. We decided we were going to go find that prison. We'd gotten permission in advance to go to that prison. So we, walk, we, we got to Africa. Our first flight lands in Nairobi. Nairobi, uh, about an hour from, from Uganda in Kenya. Uh, we're, we're sitting in the airport watching planes take off and land. And this guy, David Barrett, says to me, he says, this trip reminds me of the starfish story we've all heard in church. So I go to church. I like stories. I know Samson and Delilah. I know Rack Shack and Benny from the VeggieTales series. But I don't know the starfish story. And I said, okay, uncle, tell me. So it tells me the story. Some of you have heard this story. So there's a, there's a man standing, walking on the beach, and he sees a figure off in the distance standing up and bending up down and standing up and bending down. As he walks toward it, he realizes it's a young boy. And he says to the boy, he says, well, what are you doing? And the boy says, the sun is up and the tide is out and the star starfish are stranded on the shore. Unless I throw them back in, they're going to die in the sun. The man looks at the boy and looks at the beach and says, they're starfish as far as the eye can see. How can you possibly make a difference? The boy bent over, picked one up, threw it into the ocean and said, I made a difference for that one, didn't I? I thought, that'll preach. I like that story. No idea if it ever happened. It's a good story. And as we walked into this prison for the first time and I see this warehouse where these 21 kids are held, and as I walk in and see what the inside looks like, what's running through my mind is, this isn't okay with me. Somebody has got to do something about this. But I knew it wasn't going to be me, because I was there with three guys to try and 
be able to tell my wife and tell my kids and to tell my God, I was willing to take a step of faith. I was willing to trust you. I was not planning on being invested. But that night, I wrote an email to my wife, and here's what I said. What we saw was disturbing. The remand home was a one-room concrete rectangular warehouse about five yards by 20 yards. The ceiling was about 12 feet high, and there were wide open air slits near the ceiling that let in the air, but very little light. Inside, there were 12 foam pads for 18 boys covered with tattered blankets. There were no chairs and virtually nothing else but a few jugs of water and a chalkboard. So over the course of the week, we met with these kids. And we got the police reports, and we got the court documents, and we sat down and talked to them, and we talked to witnesses, and we figured out what their cases were about. And I found out about Henry and Joseph, because they were the only two kids in the entire prison, 18 boys, three girls that slept in a different room. They were the only two that spoke English. Now, if you read the guidebook, it says Uganda is an English-speaking country. And that's true in the capital city among the educated. You go into the village, there was only two. So they became our interpreters. We broke into two groups of two lawyers, and each group had an interpreter. Henry happened to be my interpreter. And we found all about the case between that, that he and his, his brother Joseph and his father were charged with for murder. And we looked at the evidence, and there's nothing that suggests they were involved. And he told me, he said, yeah, the, the police said, if you pay us a bribe, then we'll let you go. They didn't have any money because the thief had stolen everything they had, and they weren't inclined, inclined to pay a bribe anyway. They had no idea they were going to be there for two years. But I also found out that one month prior, December of 2009, Henry, as the katikiro, as the prime minister of the prison, had welcomed in two new prisoners. He became the Katikiro six months in, which meant he was in charge of the other prisoners. It was his job to keep them safe and to keep them fed and to keep them uh, out of trouble. Well, one of those prisoners was really sick. And the, the matron, the one adult who was out there some of the time, was, was trafficking. I've just learned the definition of trafficking uh, applies to this situation. She was hiring out these prisoners for labor in the farmer's fields and then pocketing the money. Well, one of the kids, the sick one, decided he was going to try to escape and he took off running. And Henry's job was to bring him back, so he brought him back and Rose, the matron, ordered the four most recent arrivals to give him ten strokes on the buttocks. Turns out that the boy had asthma and ultimately died of an asthma attack. And so Henry, as the katikiro, and Rose, as the matron, were charged with murder. So when I met this kid, he has two murder charges against him. Over the course of the week, we got to know each other, got to know about his family. And I said, during a break, I said, you know what? Let me show you something. There's these, thing called, these things called phones. You can call people across the street, across the country, or across the world, and talk to them just like you were standing next to them. And he pulls out, he looks at my phone. I didn't have an iPhone at the time. It was a Palm Pre. And he said, this is great. This is, I've never seen something like this. This is better than mine. I said, better than your what? He says, better than my phone. So he pulls out a phone. It's just one of these little Nokias that some of you remember from when you were kids. He says, I, I'm, since I'm the Katikiro, they, they have me keep a phone in case something goes wrong here and I can call uh, the, the warden and somebody can come out here. And then he says, is the phone number for this phone the same one on the, as on the card that you gave me when you introduced yourself? I'm like, uh-oh. This was my one and done. This was my volunteerism. This wasn't something I was going to get engaged in. And I will confess that it took longer than it should have before I said, no, 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 actually, it's a different phone number. Let me write it on the back. We left a couple days later came home, turned, back my, turned on my phone in the United States, and I had five messages, the fifth of which said, Hello, Mr. Jim. This is Henry. I just wanted to say thank you for coming. I hope you had a safe journey. Well, we've talked every week since then. But in the, in the weeks that followed, 
we talked every few days as these kids' cases were moved to court and after, as one, after the, one after the other after the other were dismissed and released. And 17 of the 21 had been released within about two weeks of our trip. And then the first trial came, and that was against Henry and Joseph and their father. First day of trial, case dismissed. We don't have any evidence against you. You can go now, Joseph and father. Henry, you need to stay because there's a second case pending against you. The joy in Henry's voice when he told me that his dad and his brother got to go home, something I will never forget. Like, you're going to be there alone now. He says, but, but it's fine. It's fine. God's in control. My case is coming up next. The next one's coming up. And that case came up a couple weeks later in February, I'm sorry, in April of 2010. And in that trial, there was one lawyer assigned to the adult and Henry. And she was representing both of them. And she decided that she was going to defend Rose and blame Henry. So he called Rose to the stand. He called one client to testify against his other client and didn't cross-examine her. None of the boys who were there who would have said, this is exactly what happened, were called to the stand predictably. They were both convicted of murder. I also won't forget that call when Henry told me that he'd been convicted of murder. Let me show you his reaction to that. I felt really out of myself. I felt as if I was dead. I felt my heart was going off. I lost hope. Really, really by then, I felt like God has given up with me. If really I have been praying for God to help me in the first case, but instead another case has piled up. Now, it's really God hearing my prayers. I think. So that that phone call that evening when he told me. He asked me the question he'd been asking every time we talked. Mr. Jim, when are you coming back to Uganda? The answer was, tomorrow. So I got on a plane. We spent three days in the prison sitting under our favorite mango tree. Some of the village kids gathered around to watch. And we just prepared his pre-sentence report, asking the judge to release him on probation while we appealed this murder conviction. We filed the the appeal with the court, the, the uh, pre-sentence report with the court, and then I headed back to Kampala to, to, to head out of town. But the head of the criminal division of the high court heard I was there and said, can you come see me in my office? So I went to his office and he said, uh, we know what you guys are doing with the kids up in, up in Masindi prison and we're so grateful to you. Um, we're sorry that our justice system is not able to handle them, but thank you for showing us the way. He said, two of your students, who were my interns last summer, did this report for us on plea bargaining. They told us there's this thing called plea bargaining that allows you to resolve cases short of trial. And we would like to do a study tour on plea bargaining to learn how this is, how this is done. They said, do you have any suggestions? I said, come to Pepperdine. And he said, great. And they did. Six members of the Ugandan High Court came to Pepperdine. They spent a week meeting with prosecutors and public defenders and judges in the federal and, trial, uh, federal and state system. They met with prison officials and the FBI and the LAPD, and they met with professors and just said, we're going to drink in what this looks like and then decide whether we can try something like this. I was a torts professor. I taught torts and evidence and legal ethics. I knew jack about criminal law other than what I learned in law school. But when they were done that week, they said, can we go somewhere to pray before we leave? I said, Great, we found this beautiful place overlooking our body of water in, in uh, at Pepperdine. And, and, and he, they said, will you pray that we'll have the courage to put into action what we've learned this week? I said, I'd be happy to. And he said, will you, will you also consider one thing? Will you consider moving to Uganda to help us implement this? I said to him what I say to anybody who asks me to do something that I don't want to do. So I said, I'll pray about it. So I did. And my wife and kids did. But in the meantime, we decided to go back to Uganda. I got another group of lawyers. We went back to another remand home. There's a bunch of remand homes in the country. We were able to get these 21 kids out. So we went to another remand home in 2010 and 2011. And then we had visits from the Ugandan judiciary. 
And during one of those visits, the chief justice of the country said, I understand that you're working on an appeal for Henry. And by the way, Henry is now out on, on um, probation, waiting for the appeal while he's going to school at Bob Goff's Restore Leadership Academy in Gulu. So this, this chief justice says, you know, there's a provision in Ugandan law that allows non-Ugandans to appear in court on behalf of people if they have permission from the chief justice. He says, do you want to do that? I said, yes, sir. So I got to become Henry's counsel of record on the appeal. But while we were doing this, we continued to pray about whether or not that was what God had in store for us as a family. And while we were doing that, uh, we, our kids got involved and we set these, call them what you will, these, these targets. If, if God wanted us to do this, then these doors would be open. And ultimately they did open. And in September of 2011, we decided we were going to move to Uganda. And some, uh, the, the guy who writes for Guidepost magazine heard about what was going on and he did a story on, uh, on Henry and me. And then we got an email the next day and it was from a family in Oklahoma. And they say, we're, we're moving to Uganda in six months as well. And we're in the medical field. And my wife had been praying intensely. What is it that we're going to be doing, my wife and three kids, while you're working with uh, the judicial system? And this family that, that got a hold of us, we call our twin family. We're Jim and Jolene Gash. They're Jay and... Jill Gregston. Our kids are Joshua, Jessica, and Jennifer. Those are Jake, Jared, and Jane. Same ages as our kids. And they're moving to Uganda for six months, the same six months off one week than we are. And I said, okay, God, I'm not going to doubt you again. You answered our prayers, of course, until the next trouble comes. But our kids, you know, were 15, 13, and 11. And my, my oldest daughter was deathly afraid of needles and said, I'll, I'll be in, involved, but I just really don't want to get too much further involved. She'd always wanted to go into medicine, but she was afraid of needles because of what happened with my son and his ears. He had to be in the hospital, intensive care. And uh, so on the first day of the medical clinic, first day of the medical clinic, Dr. J, the father, says, I need his son, Jake, and my daughter, Jessica, both 15 years old. Glove up, I'm going to teach you how to draw blood and test for HIV and malaria. So she said, Dad, I just took a, just had a quick prayer and took a step of faith. And just started drawing blood, and some of these were positive. And so that took another step of faith from my wife and I to do that. But now she's heading to Stanford next year for her physician's assistant uh, training. My younger kids got to be drug dealers. They were the ones that handed out the, uh, <laughs> uh, the medicine. And so while we were there, we created help with their assistance. Really, with, we helped them create a new system of plea bargaining for the juveniles. And we... We decided to implement this in the place we started in Missindi. And Henry and Joseph both came and were the interpreters again and talked to them about life after prison. Then we went to another juvenile prison. And then we decided we were going to go back and start working with the adults. But in March of 2013, Henry's case finally came up. Arrested in 08, on probation in 2010. His case came up for hearing in 2013, and I had a chance to put on the Harry Potter robes that they wear there and argue his case in the Ugandan Court of Appeals. A couple months later, we were in Fort Portal at an adult prison for the first time saying, if it works for juveniles and the plea bargaining was working just how we hoped it would, then let's do it in the adult realm. So 20, 2013 was, with, uh, was at one prison. 2014, we went to the maximum security prison. We brought with us a dozen lawyers, and our, our students who were over there for the summer were, were with us, and we got Ugandan law students and Ugandan lawyers to work in teams, so they're teams of four, and this is what it looked like. But before we went, someone had seen what we were doing and said they wanted to do a documentary, can we follow you? So they did, and so this is our students walking into this maximum security prison for the first time. The categories of prisoners who are here are those who have committed very serious offenses. These offenses, among others, include acts of rape, 
acts of murder, acts of aggravated robberies, aggravated defilement, treason, terrorism, and other cases that follow that category. We have no idea what any of these prisoners have done, and so we're just interviewing them blind, pretty much. We don't have their indictments or any of the trial records or anything. Hopefully we'll get that tonight. Seems like they at least have informed the prisoners that someone would be coming to uh, talk with them. And uh, we just got broken up into our teams, um, waiting to still find out who our Ugandan advocate will be. Um, but uh, yeah, just between us, it's uh, basically two gates right now, and the prison itself, where all the prisoners are. So there's really going to be no separation, it's just jumping in there and trying to see if we can help these prisoners. American law students and American lawyers are paired with a Ugandan lawyer and a Ugandan law student before meeting the prisoners. So we spent a week in there, did about 168 cases, prepared them for a resolution, and when we left, the Ugandans did the rest of it. 2015, we went back to four prisons on the eastern side of Uganda, spent a day or a day and a half in each of the prisons, and did a couple hundred cases. But just before I went, I got an, I got an email that said the ruling is now finally here. Eight, seven years after arrest, two years after argument, five years after release. And I didn't know what the answer was. I didn't know what the court had ruled, but the film crew said, can we come over there and film you learning about this for the first time and talking to Henry live on Skype? And so that's what this is. Hello, are you there? Hello. Hello, can you see me? Yeah, I'm there. I can't I can see, see you. you. Yeah, push, push the, uh, the camera button so I can see your face. So we, we got the ruling from the court. Let me read the portion that is the most important part. Oh, gotta watch the movie. Gotta buy the book. <laughs> Just kidding, I won't keep you in suspense too much longer. But in 2016 is when, when Brian came with us to, uh, to Uganda, and we did three prisons in western Uganda and did over 200 cases and uh, took a couple pictures of Brian and Megan Pepper, who was a, ba a ba Baylor law student at the time who spent the summer with our students there as well. And then 2017, did another four prisons over the course of a week, and we're heading back in March. Uh, 18 students are going on spring break to do two more prisons, and then we've got several others for this summer. But along the way, we get reminders. God shows us that there's still work to do, and Bob speaks at our, we've got a Bible study that meets at my house every, every week, and Bob speaks at the beginning of the semester. And in 2014, Bob spoke, and when he was done, he presented me with this door. The weirdest, most emotional gift I've ever received. He'd gone back to Uganda and ripped the door off of the hinges from the prison where Henry had been there. He put a new one on, but he said, I want to give you this door as a reminder that there's still work to do. There's still people behind doors, but also as a reminder that God is faithful. And as an example of that, here is the rest of the video. The court decided that the conviction was uh, in violation of the Constitution, and therefore it has been quashed and nullified. It's over. You won. Mm. But it's beautiful. Yeah, it has been perfect, actually. Thank well, you very much, Trump. Thank you, Edward Dew. You're, you're welcome. I had, a, I had a very good client to represent, someone who was, was innocent and it needed to be proven innocent, and I'm glad we had the opportunity to work together to make that happen. Yeah. I've been just waiting, praying, waiting, praying. Two things we've gotten used to doing since we met each other, huh? So there will be no new trial. Yeah. It's, it's all over. It's, it's now over. There's no appeal to the Supreme Court. You are a free man. You are uh, exonerated. All of the, the, the charges against you have been dropped and dismissed. So I had the opportunity to go to his high school graduation from Restore Leadership Academy. And as I said, we've kept in touch uh, and talk every week, even now. And as I look back on this starfish story that I heard for the first time standing in the Kenyan airport, and I think about the roles I played in this story over the course of my life. For much of my life, I was the man in that story, thinking, how can you possibly make a difference? 
and just kind of heckling from the sidelines. And then for a brief moment, God gave me the, the privilege of being the boy in that story, of trying to help somebody get back into this ocean of God's will. And then I realized when this is over that actually I'm not the man in the story and I'm not the boy in the story. I'm the starfish in that story. For 42 years, I was stranded on the, the, the sands of indifference and apathy, waiting for someone to throw me back in and waiting to, to answer the question of, do you trust me? And so some, some have asked, well, what's next? What are you guys doing next? Well, in 2015, we signed uh, an expanded memorandum of understanding with the judiciary. It's actually with the entire ju justice system, all 18 institutions. And so we're expanding our work to include civil mediation and, and now human trafficking and women in leadership, the new in initiatives. We're doing our second national conference for empowering women. That's in, in March. And then our second national conference on, uh, on anti-human trafficking in Uganda. And working very closely with IJM and, and Gary Haugen, the CEO of IJM, we're, we're, we're blessed with the privilege of having him come every year and, and teach a class. We co-teach a class in March every year for 10 days. He teaches, I grade the papers. I think it's his kind of co-teaching that uh, he prefers. And so what we're going to do is we're expanding into Ghana. And uh, you, you, we, we look for countries that have some characteristics. English-speaking British common law system so our students can get engaged. Uh, safe democracies and stable uh, governments. And so Ghana is probably next. And what Brian didn't mention is when we were in Uganda together in 2015, we started dreaming together about what it might look like for Baylor to adopt a country. And one of our, uh, actually he was there in 16, and in 2015, one of the people who came with us, with us on a prison project was an American lawyer who used to work for IJM who's now uh, it's, it's stayed in Zambia, and so I said, you guys need to meet each other because Baylor has got a lot of connections with Zambia, and Brian said, count me in, let me see if I can lead the charge, and Dean Tobin has been quite uh, encouraging and is actually heading out there uh, next week to, to, to pave the way for eight Baylor students going to Zambia and starting its own work in that country, and so it's, it's an exciting thing to watch from the perspective of those who are our cheerleaders in this regard. So the question that I have for you and the question that I have for me, if you're a person of faith, who's writing your story? If you're not a person of faith, what is keeping you from taking the next step? What is it? Is it fear? Because I, I know fear of failure drives all of us. It drives me. But the thing that I found that drove me even more was fear of success. Because if you take a step of faith into the unknown and there's something there for you to do, then everything changes. And you realize that maybe I'm supposed to be living in Africa for six months with my family. Maybe I'm supposed to be going there regularly. And that's scary. But I encourage you to take a step of faith. And, and uh, in a moment, I'll tell you more about the book that we wrote. But I'm going to see if the miracle of modern technology will help us uh, bring somebody else into this conversation. percent of the time we connect so cross your fingers hello can you hear me hello. yeah i can hear you can you see everybody yes i can hey this is this is uh henry's second visit to baylor Yes. We, we came out here in January of, of uh, 16 when uh, the book was first released and we did kind of a national tour and uh, President Starr was kind enough to invite us here. And so we're back here at Baylor and the first question that uh, I haven't answered for everybody that they may have is what are you doing now? What is it that keeps you busy during the day? Okay, um, I'm now at school. I'm, in a, I'm a medical student. I'm working in a regional referral hospital, and uh, at this time I'm in the theater. I I was in the theater, and I came out. I was like, yes, I need to first at least talk to the Baylor, and like I visit Baylor the second time. So, so I'm in the hospital right now. So tell me, uh, how many years of medical school have you completed? 
So far now, um, four and a half years. And when will you be a doctor? In 2019, that is next year. Excellent. And why, do you want to, why did you want to be a doctor? Why did you go into medicine? Okay, uh, while I was in prison during that time, I was given opportunity to take care of my fellow juveniles. And um, I could always take them to the government hospital. So each time I could go there, we could line up for a long time. Um, and the doctor could work upon the few patients who were there and of which he could work upon those whom he knows. And then after then he says he's going for breakfast, he's going for lunch, and I could find out that the whole day we are not worked upon and we're just in the line suffering. So I was like, maybe if I really get released and God helps me and, and I'm out of the prison, I think I can become a doctor and at least I make a change even if I'm one. So from there, really, I got encouraged that if I'm released, I will become a doctor. And it has come to pass because I'm already in medical school. So um, let's talk about the time you were in prison. When you were in prison, um, your mother used to visit you. And what would she tell you? Okay, while in prison, my mother used to visit me and she was always telling me that, Henry, be strong. Everything... Okay, he, she used to tell me that nothing lasts forever except the word of God. And I really kept knowing that, that there is nothing which lasts forever except the word of God. And it really came to pass. I was in prison for a long period of time and I was losing hope. My mother was telling me that Henry, stay strong. Nothing lasts forever except the word of God. That was the key word she used to tell me. And it really came to pass because it did last forever. I'm now out, and the word of God still exists. And why was it important? Because you'd already been released on probation. Why was it important that your conviction be overturned and you be acquitted? Okay, uh, if you're a doctor in Uganda or anywhere else, you are not supposed to have a conviction. So I was always fasting, praying to become a doctor which was true that I entered the medical school. But now I had a conviction behind me, meaning even if I had become a doctor, I wouldn't be allowed to practice with the conviction. So it was really important to be exonerated so that my certificate could be valid and viable to work as a doctor. So when I was exonerated, I'm now free. Immediately I become a doctor, I can be able to practice. Excellent. And what's your brother Joseph doing who was in prison with you for two years? Wow. Okay. She's doing law. She's in a law school. And this is her second year of law school. You heard him say she and her in Uganda pronouns are not the same. So Joseph is a male or female? Oh, he's a male. He is in medical. He is in a, a law school. That's what I say. <laughs> So to Joseph is, is uh, going to be a lawyer, Henry is going to be a doctor, and uh, we, we try to finish when we, I know we're running short of time, but what we like to do when we finish is Henry likes to pray for the audience, and so he's going to end us in prayer. My pleasure. Okay, please, may we help ourselves for the yeah. Father in heaven, I thank you for this wonderful time and the beautiful visit you have granted me to Bela once again. As I'm talking, all I'm going to father to your people, may you reign amid us, may you be with us, may you protect us, may you forgive us for what we have gone through, and may you, Lord my God, fulfill our heart desires so that whatever we touch, whatever everybody touches is blessed and it comes to pass. Father in heaven, I pray for your protection. As you are going to depart, I pray. That our Father lets depart boldly, but in the Spirit will remain one. At this moment, our Father, I pray for blessings upon everybody as I communicate right now. That our Father, that whatever they are going to be doing, whatever they have been praying for, let it come to pass in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. 
I believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Henry. Talk to you in a few days. Bye. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. Uh, yeah. So, as, as I close, one thing you could probably notice I was reading from a book. It was a, it's a book that we decided that, that we would both write together, dual first person, his perspective and my perspective. It's called Divine Collision because we felt like there was just no reason in the world that a, a law professor from Malibu would meet a kid in prison from the Cindy if it wasn't divinely orchestrated. And so uh, we, we published this in 2016. He came out and got to tour the country. At the same time, this, uh, this remand film uh, was created. And uh, so both of them are available outside. Henry, when he was here, did, uh, did a lot of signing of books. He signed, he signed several hundred and so we have some that uh, he signed and then some that aren't signed by him available out there as well. So if you have any questions about uh, what's, what's uh, going on in his life or what's going on in our work, I'd be happy to talk with you afterward. And so uh, thank you for your time and attention. It's been a joy to be with you.